Today's lesson is on reproduction and prenatal development. You're welcome. Today we are going to look at the human reproductive systems. In the male reproductive organs, sperm develops in the testes. Uh, sperm need a temperature cooler than the body's normal 97 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the scrotum is a pouch that actually holds the testes uh, away from the body in order to maintain a cooler temperature than 97 degrees. The seminal vesicles here are glands that secrete semen, which is a sugary fluid that nourishes the sperm so that the sperm can survive long enough in order to fertilize the egg. Uh, the female's reproductive tract is actually acidic, and so the prostate gland here produces a basic or alkaline solution that actually neutralizes this acidic, um, the acidity of the female's reproductive organs. The semen and the sperm are then, uh, they then travel through the vas deferens. Uh, there are two of them which then join into the urethra. The urethra, uh, its purpose is to carry um, both uh, semen and urine outside of the body through the penis. Men can actually produce 100 to 200 million sperm a day and can actually produce sperm their entire lives. The purpose of the female reproductive system is to produce egg cells, receive sperm, and it is also where the egg is fertilized. The ovaries are where immature eggs, called oocytes, are formed. Women are actually born with a set amount of oocytes in their ovaries. Approximately every 28 days, oocyte development is stimulated and an ovum is formed. When that egg is released uh, from the ovary, it travels through the fallopian tube. Um, the ovum will then implant in the endometrium. The endometrium is the blood lining um, that is lining the uterus. Depending on if fertilization occurs, either the ovum will become a baby, or if it is unfertilized, it will be released during menstruation. The baby develops before birth within the uterus uh, if, the, um, if the egg is actually fertilized. The cervix is a narrow opening to the vagina, uh, which leads to the outside of the body. The vagina has multiple purposes, one of which is to accept sperm, the other is to uh, release blood during menstruation, and it also is where the baby passes through during childbirth. So we're actually going to focus on the female more today since the female is the location where the ovum is actually fertilized to become the zygote. Remember, the zygote is the first cell of a human. This graph right here shows the different aspects of the menstrual cycle. On average, a woman's menstrual cycle, again, is 28 days long, and it is divided into three phases, the follicular phase, and the luteal phase, and the flow phase, which here is menstruation. The flow phase is day one, as you can see. Uh, that's when the menstrual flow begins, which is the release of the endometrium. Remember that the endometrium is the blood layer that lines our uterus. Menstruation should only last about four to seven days. As you can see here, uh, the release of blood flow goes down. Around day five, the endometrium begins to be repaired and it becomes thicker throughout the cycle, as we can see here. In the follicular phase, so right here, an immature oocyte in the ovary uh, is surrounded by what is called the follicle, um, which protects it. The follicle matures in the ovary for about the first 13 days, as we can see here. Uh, after those 13 days, on the 14th day, the follicle actually ruptures, as you can see here, which is called ovulation, which is when um, the mature egg is released, and that begins the time in which a woman can actually become pregnant. During ovulation, a woman's body temperature actually increases, as we can see here, and during this 48-hour window, so day 13 to day 15, is actually the highest chance um, in which fertilization can occur. That's why couples who are trying to get pregnant will often monitor the woman's body temperature because it shows when ovulation is occurring. The stage after ovulation is called the luteal phase. Uh, if the egg is not fertilized, then the cells of the follicle will change and will turn into what is called the corpus luteum. Uh, eventually, at the end of the cycle, the corpus luteum breaks down to become the degenerate corpus luteum. Uh, at this point, this triggers the detachment of the endometrium, and the flow uh, for the cycle actually begins again. 
If the egg is fertilized after ovulation, a different chain of events occurs and a new menstrual cycle does not begin. Uh, the embryo will actually implant in our endometrium where it is nourished by oxygen and nutrients that are found in the blood of the endometrium. The corpus luteum here does not um, degenerate, so the endometrium actually accumulates fats and starts secreting fluid rich in nutrients in order to develop the embryo. Fertilization, as you can see in this picture, actually requires hundreds of sperm. The egg has a jelly coat right here uh, that prevents sperm from entering it. Each sperm actually kind of digests or eats part of that jelly coat. One lucky sperm, this guy right here, is able to finally enter. It's kind of like a team effort. As soon as that lucky sperm gets in, the egg then creates a hard coat around it in order to prevent any, <coughs> any new sperm from entering. At this point, you can see that our sperm nucleus uh, combines with our egg nucleus in order to make our zygote nucleus. Remember, the zygote is the um, fertilized egg. So now that we have a fertilized egg, we can talk about prenatal development. The word natal actually means birth, and then of course pre means before. So prenatal means that we're going to be talking about what's going on uh, while the baby is actually in the womb. Right now it's important to talk about how one cell, that zygote, becomes trillions of cells. Uh, the adult bodies that we're made up of actually have trillions of cells. Mitosis is a specific type of cell division in which uh, there are two daughter cells that are completely identical to their parent cell. Um, so remember that in meiosis, uh, it's different because meiosis produces four daughter cells that only have 26, 23 chromosomes. For mitosis, you actually produce two daughter cells that each have 46 chromosomes or two N chromosomes. It is used for tissue growth. It's also used uh, for when you're growing up or when your body is repairing damage. So during inner phase, our phase right here, it's actually exactly the same as during meiosis's interphase. The DNA chromosomes duplicate, so they go from this to our X-shaped sister chromatids. Uh, remember that during prophase, uh, the nuclear envelope right here actually disintegrates, uh, kind of freeing up our chromosomes. However, during pro prophase, these chromosomes do not pair up to make those homologous pairs. Uh, so instead, during metaphase, all 46 of those chromosomes line up by themselves. As you can see, they're all lined up in a single row. So then during anaphase, um, the sister chromatids are actually pulled apart from each other during this time, um, and that results in us getting two different cells, all right, each of which have 46 chromosomes, because they each got 46 of the sister chromatids. Uh, so during telophase, uh, remember those two nuclei reform around our uh, chromosomes, and the daughter cells are then created through the process of cytokinesis, which cuts this in half, and we now have our final two daughter cells, which look exactly identical to the parent cell. So now we know how cells copy themselves in order to create more. On day one, remember we have our zygote, it's a single cell. On day, sorry, that was day zero. On day one, the zygote undergoes mitosis to make two identical daughters. Um, so we can see that right here. We have two cells by day two. On day three, we now have four cells. And then day four, we actually have 32 cells, uh, which this mass of 32 cells is called the morula. Uh, on day seven, right here, um, there's something called the blastocyst, uh, which implants in the endometrium. The blastocyst is actually mostly hollow, as you can see, except for this little infolded part. Uh, this infolded part eventually becomes our embryo, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so this and the outer part of the blastocyst will eventually become the placenta around the embryo. So remember that every single one of our cells has the same exact DNA. However, all cells don't actually show the same characteristics. For example, a blood cell is different from a nervous cell, which is different from a bone cell. Uh, it's kind of obvious. However, um, all cells actually start out exactly the same. As development continues, however, the cells decide to specialize or they kind of choose their job. The morula, remember we talked about that, that was, um, I believe, day four of development. The morula 
um, contains what are called totipotent cells. Um, you think of the word, the prefix toti, toti means total. So these totipotent stem cells actually have the potential to become all cells, any type of cell. Um, hence toti for total. The blastocyst, remember that's day seven, the blastocyst contains what are called pluripotent cell, pluripotent. Um, pluripotent cells can't become any type like our totipotent. However, they are actually split into three different groups. There's the hematopoietic stem cells, the neural stem cells, and the mesenchymal stem, stem cells. Um, each cell in this group has the potential to become many different types of, stem, of cells, but not all types. For example, the hematopoietic cells can become red blood cells, they can become white blood cells, they can become platelets. The prefix pluri uh, means many, which kind of makes sense. These pluripotent cells can become many different types of cells, such as these ones, but they can't actually become all of them. Stem cell research is done using these totipotent and these pluripotent stem cells, um, but because they can actually grow into new cells that are specific to what the body needs. However, this can be a controversial issue. So here's the timeline of a baby's development. We can see that ovulation occurs right here. Um, the ovum is then fertilized right then. Uh, the blastocyst is fully formed after one week. So we see one week is our blastocyst. Uh, the embryo forms within the blastocyst just a couple days later. Uh, we can see that the baby goes from being very small and kind of looking like a shrimp all the way to being very much looking like a baby around 16 weeks or four months after fertilization. So the uh, baby is actually called an embryo up until week nine, in which at that point it is then called the fetus. And it is called the fetus throughout the rest of the pregnancy. Alright, so you made it through. See you in class.